Okay, let's resume. Before I get into my talk on being already home, uh, I'd like to comment on meditation for a moment and point out that one of the benefits of meditation is that it enables us to recognize certain key states of being, certain key uh, ways of being or ways of being in our body, uh, and certain key uh, aspects in consciousness that after we recognize them, we can uh, become increasingly stable in them in our regular life when we are not engaging in formal practice. So for example, this, the feeling of landing in the present and remaining present in the present Huh, that's a really useful thing that meditation helps us recognize. Uh, a sense of open-heartedness, warm-heartedness, you know, a basic um, wishing others well, so perhaps with compassion, kindness, friendliness, even love. Oh, what's that feel like? What's it feel like <clears throat> to be present while being in touch with your heart? both the physical sensations in that area of the chest, as well as the emotional aspects of being heartfelt, wholehearted. Can you bring those together? Presence and wholeheartedness. Oh, what's that like? Can you start to recognize that experience? Differentiate it from other experiences. Know what that's like so that you can increasingly build that up as a trait or as a uh, way of being that's accessible to you. You can find it, maybe even becomes habitual for you, right? And same with, uh, as we progressed, the distinction between being and becoming. The Buddha really flagged that distinction. And he talked about our attachments to becoming which now 2,500 years later, brain scientists have really emphasized the ways in which the brain functions a lot as a prediction machine, an expectation generator that's continually generating expectations and then driving behavior based on those expectations and then reevaluating behavior based on how close to the expectations we come, becoming. And what's it like? to rest in being without any movement into becoming. And you'll probably notice that the movement into becoming, as natural and commonplace as it is, has a certain contraction in it, a certain pressure in it. That's not entirely happy. And it becomes interesting to explore, hey, can I rest in being as the ground of doing and the ground of, become, of becoming? What's that like? What's that like, to rest in being distinct from becoming? That's useful, because then we can deepen it. And then even eventually certain kinds of knowings come to us as we deepen in our meditation that may not seem logical, and yet we know they're true somehow, that the boundary between inner and outer, self and world, is quite fuzzy. And yes, there is a difference between our intangible extreme of consciousness and very tangible stuff, right, out in the world, but still the nature of our stream of consciousness and the nature of stuff out in the world is identical. Inner and outer are same, same in that they are inner and outer, are each made of parts that are connected and changing. Oh. And dynamically intertwining in one integrated, you know, inner and outer 
self and world, mind and matter process. Oh, what's it like to get that? And then can we live more and more from that realization in everyday life? As the great teachers uh, have called us to. So meditation is very helpful in these ways. This is one of the benefits of meditation, being able to kind of quiet the mind enough and purify the mind enough to recognize certain things, which then, and then, and then we can build on that recognition in everyday life. Okay. So I would like to talk with you uh, and begin a series that I'm going to do on wise effort. Wise effort is one of the eight elements in the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, there's a very specific meaning of it in um, early Buddhism. And I want to broaden it out to the broad inquiry of as we find ourselves here in this world of wonders, what? <laughs> Reality? Birth? Bodies? Other people? The evening news? How do we be with it? How do we practice with it? What's appropriate effort? What's inappropriate effort? How can we disengage from efforts that are not skillful or wise or useful? And how can we engage efforts that are really good for us and others? That's a broad topic. And this time, tonight, I'd like to focus with you on what could be really the foundation of all wise effort, which is the sense of being already home. What do I mean by that? I mean this in very practical ways. And the more that things are turbulent in your life or in your mind, the more important it is to find your footing, to find kind of a stable platform that feels good because you're at home in it. It feels it is your true home. It feels good in a challenging world. So the sense of finding what is your true home, where can you be at home? And how can you deepen your sense of being at home in ways that are independent of external conditions? This is really useful. It's as useful as feeling like you are centered and at home in yourself while you're dealing with a really problematic person. That's really useful. Also, the other side of the coin uh, is contained in the saying that all sickness at bottom is homesickness. Wow, it's a very profound proverb. The root of all sickness is homesickness. Certain, first, certainly in the narrow biological sense that we are um, not um, in the home base, the, equal, the healthy equilibrium condition that is natural to us. Yes, and also uh, in a broad sense, the root of all sickness is homesickness, and particularly psychological forms of distress, dysfunction, um, depression, anxiety, loneliness. At bottom, these have to do with uh, being um, alienated from the natural world, from others, even alienated from ourselves, so that we're living in a kind of chronic inner homelessness. How can we counter that, right? How can we find the benefits of being at home and how can we um, heal that root of all sickness, which is homesickness? That's what I hope to explore with you in practical ways. Um, so I have five suggestions. What a surprise. I have a little list. First, um, as the Buddha taught, we can come home to our refuges. Refuge. A refuge sounds fancy. It's anything that feels protective and nurturing, even inspiring. Inspiring. Um, so, for example, in very concrete terms, what are your refuges? What, what are your go-tos, right? Uh, at, 
are there physical places that are a refuge for you? Uh, I've lived in my home. I've had the privilege of living here for many years now, and it's quite a refuge. You know, I pull up at my front door, my car, or I walk home and it's like, oh, okay, it's my home. Now there are many people who are unhoused. I recognize that. So we look for refuges where we can find them. Maybe a refuge is uh, your cat crawling into your lap. Maybe your refuge is a favorite sweater uh, or a bathrobe. Uh, maybe it is a, is a book of teaching that you really like, you really care about. Um, you know, I find a sense of refuge in different books, various kinds. Um, you know, right now I'm reading a really beautiful book about the great Zen master Dogen called Realizing Genjo Koan. It may seem a little technical, but actually it's so clearly written and so profound. It's a refuge for me. Realizing Genjo Koan uh, by Okumura. So what do you find as refuge? I Science, factual information is a refuge for me. Nature, being in nature is a refuge. Even when <laughs> there's a storm and it's cold, it's still a kind of refuge for me. What's a refuge for you? Then in the Buddhist tradition, we have the classic refuges of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, which can be understood in various ways. One way to understand the Buddha is of a teacher a coach, a physician of sorts, that we respect and have some trust in due to their own example, the quality of their own life. We can also understand Buddha in its tr deep meaning of buddho, of uh, knowing, one who knows, the inner capacity in all of us to, to know deeply, uh, to be realized, uh, Buddha, Dharma, uh, Dharma narrowly is the collection of teachings, such as in the Buddhist tradition. You could broaden that to think about teachings in other traditions, perhaps in modern psychology. And Dharma is also a, different, a reality. So it's kind of weird, but it's cool to think about taking refuge in reality as it is, in suchness as it is. That could be a refuge for you. And then Sangha. Originally referring to the monastics who devoted their lives to practice, and kind of were a, a central storehouse of teachings, um, broadening the notion of Sangha as well, particularly in these modern times, to be uh, fellow travelers on the path, a sense of community, you know, including people who care about um, a tradition or a teaching stream that you care about. So right here, as I go through these five, Ask yourself, huh, how could I you know, feel at home in these? And how could I come home in ways that would be good for you in the, kind, in the various things that we're exploring here? One aspect of Sangha that I find particularly relevant these days is a sense of fellowship with others who care deeply uh, about what you care about, including um, a compassionate and just world. And so in the chat here, I'm gonna put the first of multiple quotations I'm gonna to offer tonight from Adrian Rich, wonderful poet, who writes, my heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who, who age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. Can we find refuge in a sense of camaraderie, community, fellowship, with others like ourselves who are doing what we can to reconstitute the world? You may know, uh, you know, Mr. Rogers, uh, I think of as an American saint, um, he uh, uh, tells that when he was a boy and upset about this or that, his mother would say to him, Frank, look for those who are helping. Who are the helpers? We can find community with them. Also related to that, I wanna offer a poem from Gary Snyder titled 
for the children. Oops. Here we go. In these up and down days, it can really help to have a sense of camaraderie, camaraderie with others who, like you, are trying to mend what is torn in our world. So Gary Snyder writes, for the children, the rising hills, the slopes of statistics lie before us. The steep climb of everything going up, up as we all go down. In the next century, or the one beyond that, they say, are valleys, pastures. We can meet there in peace if we make it. To climb these coming crests, one word to you, to you and your children. Stay together. Learn the flowers. Go light. Stay together. Um, if you are not seeing the quote in the chat, you can scroll up, particularly if you've been here uh, in the meeting before I put the quote in the chat, you should be able to see it. And uh, if you're not able to see the Adrian Rich quote, perhaps somebody else can put it in the chat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Auntie. Then there's the refuge of practice. It's one of the most reliable refuges of all, to know that you are practicing. That's a refuge. It's available to us at just about any moment. Sometimes we're so shocked. We're just so flooded. We're so uh, filled with pain. We can't practice in that moment. But very soon, usually, usually, not always, but usually, we can find a little bit of breathing room in which we can then practice. And for me, practice is like a three-legged stool, three legs. In Pali, the legs are metta, sati, and bhavana, which could be summarized as loving, uh, mindfulness, and learning. All three together. So you might ask yourself, huh, is one of those three worth particularly developing more of these days because it's the shortest of the three legs? For many people, learning bhavana, the deliberate conversion of states to traits, helping experiences leave lasting value is the one that they leave out. So you might focus on that. Uh, practice is a refuge. You can come home to your practice and enjoy practice. I love practice, you know, I've, and we tend to get better at what we, what we like. And so it's, 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 on, it's on mission. It's very practical to learn to love practice. And then last, the refuge of making efforts, wise efforts of knowing that you've done what you can. You try, you bring a work ethic to it. You put in a decent day. You don't have to sweat bullets. You don't have to go crazy. You don't have to pressure yourself. You have to honor your own capacities, especially as you age, um, certainly, or for other reasons. But still, in the context of what is doable reasonably, know that you've you know, put in a good day's work. There's a place for that. Okay, we can take refuge in that. And then you go to bed knowing, you know, whatever happened, I tried hard today. I did my best for real. No blame. Okay? So that's the first way to come home. Coming home to our refuges and being at home in our refuges. Then there's being at home in our own biology. Number two. Hmm. What is the home base? of a living animal like you and me. If you know at all my material about red zone, green zone, a lot of stuff there, I'll just summarize it. As we evolved uh, as animals, uh, we needed to take care of our needs because by taking care of your needs, you pass on genes that can pass on genes. Taking care of needs. What do we need? Different models of needs. Adams Maslow had his hierarchy. A very fundamental model in biology and psychology is the three overarching needs as umbrella terms of safety, satisfaction, and connection, broadly defined. So as you come home to a sense of needs met enough in the moment, 
in part because you've been developing psychological resources and intervening as best you can in your environment, as you come home to a sense of needs met enough in the moment, well, that's the green zone. That's the green zone in which there's little unnecessary stress and it's the equilibrium condition in our physiology. We kind of settle in, the heart finds its own rhythm, there's enough breathing, you know, we're not wildly disturbed. Boom, we've come home. And very often we can have that sense of, a, of feeling safe enough, satisfied enough and connected enough in the present, even as we deal with challenges. So that in the present, you can come home to a growing sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love. That's the home base. That's the home base of our body and our mind. You know, a genuine sense in the core of your being of peacefulness, contentment, and love. I want to emphasize being at home in the heart because as we experience feeling at home in the heart, rested in the heart, that helps us feel safer and it also helps us feel satisfied. And to that, these days especially, it includes having compassion for those that we differ with, right? How do we have compassion for the people we disagree with? And how can we stabilize in that sense of compassion, you know, while they're yelling at us or ranting online or trying to troll us? So... Um, this is from Miller Williams, a wonderful poet and the father of uh, Lucinda Williams, the great, great country western singer-songwriter. Have compassion for everyone you meet, even if they don't want it. What seems conceit, bad manners, or cynicism is always a sign of things no ears have heard, no eyes have seen. You do not know what wars are going on down there where the spirit meets the bone. You know, we can come home to that sense of the heart. Is the heart your home? It's a good home. It's nice furniture there. <laughs> good wallpaper when you're at home in the heart. And obviously, of course, what I'm talking about is aspirational. Sometimes we're not home. Sometimes we've been driven from our home. We're running for our lives. We're a refugee. We're being bombed. You know, we're targeted by atrocities. Just understandable, whatever it might be. Okay? But the more that the world around us is driving us from home, the more important it is to practice inside ourselves, to find the homes that are available to us by finding the ways in which we are safe enough in the present, even if we're threatened and we're dealing with things, finding the ways that we can be content rather than discontent in a sense of the enoughness right now, and ways in which we can feel rested in our own heart even if other people aren't. We can come home to all that. Okay. And then, third, in addition to the gradual cultivation, <clears throat> which is the essence of resilience, <clears throat> of an unconditional core of coping and well-being that's grounded in an underlying, unshakable sense of uh, peacefulness, contentment, and love in the core of your being. Even if, understandably, around it argh, is a lot of other stuff. But what's underneath it all? What's, what's in that unshakable core of being, actually, in which you're rested at peace, content, and with a warm heart? We can deepen in, in, that, in the practice of that so more and more it becomes our trait. All right. Number three, 
we can be at home in the present. Most of our suffering involves mental time travel. That's the term in psychology, in which we're you know, preoccupied about the past, caught up in you know, resentments, regrets, remorse, etc. Or we're preoccupied with the future, particularly in terms of anxiety or getting caught up in little mini-movies, little fantasies of, of vengeance, retribution, punishment, reproach, grievance. We're not in the present. There's so much teaching in the Dharma about the value of being in the present. Uh, I love the phrase that those who remain in the present, uh, their complexions are serene. Right? And so I'd like to drop in here a quotation from the great James Baldwin, what a being. Which is very relevant as well for social action context here in part was him responding to people, including liberals of his time, the 1950s in America, 1960s, who said, well, well, don't be so impatient. Things will get better. And his reply, which is uh, very on point in general, is there is never time in the future in which we will work out our salvation. The challenge is in the moment, the time is always now. 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 Being in the present. You know, endlessly arising. Endlessly given to us. One of the great benefits of taking your seat more and more in the present is that it opens you up to the endless givingness of the present. Incredible ongoing generosity of the emergingness of the present. The unfoldingness of the universe given to us as we are ourselves unfolding in the universe. Wow, <laughs> there's a lot there <laughs> continually given to us. And then William Stafford has a beautiful way of talking about this. Let's see if I can do this properly. Yes. In his poem, You Reading This, Be Ready. Ah, very good. You reading this, be ready, he writes. Starting here, what do you want to remember? How sunlight creeps along a shining floor? What scent of old wood hovers? What softened sound from outside fills the air? Will you ever bring a better gift for the world than the breathing respect you carry wherever you go right now? Are you waiting for time to show you some better thoughts? When you turn around, starting here, lift this new glimpse that you found. Carry into evening all that you want from this day. This interval you spent reading or hearing this, keep it for life. What can anyone give you? Oh, I didn't post the message, I beg your pardon. I didn't post the poem. I'll keep going now. Um, when you turn around, starting here, lift this new glimpse that you found. Carry into evening all that you want from this day. This interval you spent reading or hearing this, keep it for life. What can anyone give you greater than now? Starting here, right in this room, when you turn around. What can anyone give you greater than now? So we train in meditation deliberately to rest in being instead of becoming, to rest in the present as it passes through awareness endlessly, right? Most of the time, we're basically all right right now. Resting there is our home base. It's a great refuge, isn't it, to be at home in the present. Um, 
it's quite something to realize, of course, that as we disengage from our mental time travel, we, we're, we're here. We're here already because we're always here already, right? Uh, and training in that, and including in ways if you're interested in, in, in my book, uh, Neurodharma, one of the seven great both fruits of awakening and paths to awakening is receiving nowness endlessly, right at the front edge of now as it emerges endlessly into being, receiving it. And there's, you know, different ways to do that, including just kind of resting in the emergingness of the present before suffering has had much of a chance to sink in, and continually renew. So that's, that's the third place we can find our home. We can feel already home, already home in the present. And then number four, this starts getting a little more out there. We can feel at home increasingly in the ground of all, in the underlying ground of everything. And one of the keys to that that the Buddha really emphasized is deepening vipassana, deepening insight into the recognition that everything is connected. We rest in a field of relationships. There's so many beautiful uh, quotations about this. Uh, I'm going to share one right now from Thich Nhat Hanh, the great master Thich Nhat Hanh. He writes, in the past I have been a cloud, a river in the air, and I was a rock. I was the minerals in the water. This is not a question of belief in reincarnation. This is the history of life on earth. Right? And again, to repeat, as in practice, uh, there is both the aspect of recognizing what is available to us right now and understanding things as aspiration. And we decide for ourselves if we want to go down that path that's aspirational, in which we, we aim, and certain things may be so out of reach, then so be it. We don't, we don't do that. What's the next that step that's available? So as Gina has written here, uh, 16 minutes past the hour, um, you know, there are edge cases where we hit the limits of our compassion. That's where we're at. Okay. Okay, so we practice with what's within reach. And I think sometimes people can become overly engaged with edge cases or extreme versions. Understandably, you think about that stuff, but if it's out of reach, it's out of reach. You know, there's this principle in developmental psychology, the zone of proximal development, where we focus on, you know, what's within reach, but not yet stable because that's where opportunity is. If it's already stable in us, there's not much learning available from here. And if it's out of reach, it's out of reach, right? Where can we focus in our practice? And that's what I invite you all to focus on in the chat. What's, it, what's re relevant for your practice? What's within reach that still might be a bit of a stretch for you? Here's another quotation about, uh, you know, being at home in the ground of all. This comes from Alan Watts. Whose book on the taboo against knowing who you are, from which I'm quoting here, drove me crazy when I first started reading it at age 21. <laughs> he writes, you didn't come into this world. You came out of it like a wave from the ocean. You are not a stranger here, right? You did not come into the world. You came out of the world like a wave from the ocean. You are not a stranger here. This is a way of feeling at home in the, in the knowing of the sea. It's like the wave knowing the ocean. That's a kind of, um, you know, it's a kind of homecoming, right? In our in the 
ground of all that is our true home, because it's factually true that we are all waves in the ocean of reality. Deepening this, going maybe further, I'm going to take it further. You don't have to go all the way with me here, but I'm going to go there. Do, do, do. This is from Kalu Rinpoche, quoted, quoted in the Meditation Hut at Spirit Rock Meditation Center. Um, you live in illusion and the appearance of things. There is a reality, but you do not know this. When you understand this, you will see that you are nothing. And being nothing, you are everything. That is all. <laughs> Drop the mic. Thank you, Kalu Rinpoche. <laughs> right? So we're, we're, he's, you know, he's speaking to the ways in which we live in the delusion of separation. Albert Einstein talked about that delusion of separation. We live in that delusion. It's a constructed delusion by a brain because it's a very effective way for lizards, mice, and monkeys, and humans, and so on, um, to function in reality, to feel separated from it, beleaguered by it, to act upon it, separation. That's, that's, a, that's part of the truth. Each wave is separate from other waves, yes, and all waves are being made by the ocean, and the nature of all waves is water. Okay. When we recognize that, we realize, oh, the separate wave is, just has no independent identity. Precious though I may have thought my independent identity was, I'm, that identity was nothing, and realizing that that identity is nothing, wow. Everything, identity, identified with everything, manifesting locally. Okay. And then Wendell Berry takes all this, maybe even a bit of a step further. He writes, a grace living here as we live. Move my mind now to that, to that which holds things as they change. The Buddha focused on that which is unconditioned. As a kind of ground or field, here two words break down, unconditionality as a, a space, a field, a, a basis in which conditioned phenomena keep occurring. In other words, unconditionality is that which holds things as they change. And Wendell Berry, I believe a Christian, took it, you know, took that a little step further and he, you know, attributed qualities of grace, perhaps consciousness and benevolence together as attributes of that ground, that timelessness, that eternity, that stillness, which holds things as they change. So we can come. We can, if this is our true ground, it's 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 the basement of our home. It's the foundation of our home. We can come home to the foundation to the foundation of our livingness, as these great teachers speak. Or right. Okay. And then fifth, being at home in ourselves in a way that can feel extremely sweet and intimate. As I've moved through the one, two, three, four, including number four, it could get kind of cosmic, a little out there, like whoa. And then fifth, coming home to ourselves, the immediacy of this moment of experiencing and a, uh, a sense of accepting ourselves. You know, being at home with all the parts of ourselves, no bad parts, as Richard Schwartz puts it, founder of um, Internal Family Systems. Uh, we can be at home with our parts even as we regulate some of them. 
and encourage others to come on out and play. So here I want to quote again the great Thich Nhat Hanh as we finish. Oh, my message is too long, Zoom tells me. Okay, Zoom. Um, here we go. I'll break this up in two parts. Okay, that's part one. You can start reading it if you like. And this is part two. So I'll read this and then we'll move to a finish. Thich Nhat Hanh writes, your purpose is to be yourself. You don't have to run anywhere to become someone else. You are wonderful just as you are. This teaching of the Buddha allows us to enjoy ourselves, the blue sky and everything that is refreshing and healing in the present moment. There is no need to put anything in front of us and run after it. We already have everything we are looking for, everything we want to become. The Heart Sutra says that there is nothing to attain. We meditate not to attain enlightenment because enlightenment is already in us. We don't have to search anywhere. We don't need a purpose or a goal. We don't practice in order to obtain some high position. In aimlessness, we see that we do not lack anything, that we already are what we want to become, and our striving just comes to a halt. We are at peace in the present moment, just seeing the sunlight streaming through our window or hearing the sound of the rain. People talk about entering nirvana, but we are already there. I think what's really helpful here is to not be nitpicky about any particular words here, or you know, or kind of spin out into intellectualizing, but to feel the spirit of accepting yourself, you know, being at home in your own skin. You're okay already. You, know? you are, I am, you know, a manifestation of 10,000 powerful forces making the body, making the evolved nature of our species, you know, 10,000 forces shaping us from the moment we were conceived shaping our conception itself, you know, the particular coming together of, you know, the genes that began to make us, all of it, you know, there's nothing, <laughs> we can't help being ourselves, so we may as well like ourselves. As Thich Nhat Hanh calls us to. So, to finish here, I really invite you to explore what it feels like to come home. I believe that Su Suzuki Roshi uh, wrote something close to, he said, the feeling of enlightenment is the feeling of coming home. I believe that Ming Yur Rinpoche uh, talks about meditation as the feeling of arriving home from a long trip with your baggage and dropping your bags and plopping into a favorite chair or place and simply uh, landing at home, right? So valuable, especially with the various forces that want to pull our attention away from our true home inside toward various shiny objects, one kind or another. Uh, you know, pull us away from our center to buy this or get angry about that. <clears throat> so I invite you this week to really keep 
bringing up in a fresh way the sense of coming home. And you might explore the five aspects of coming home that I've explored with you. To quickly repeat, to being at home in your refuges of various kinds, being at home in your own biology, your own neuropsychology, at home in the green zone, you know, finding your way at home, building up that home base inside you, hardwired literally into your nervous system. Number three, being at home in the present. Because we already are in the present, we might as well be at home there. Number four, at home in the ground of all. Certainly in terms of interdependence, inner being, and perhaps even more deeply uh, into a sense of what is unconditioned, uh, perhaps what is conscious and kind as the ground of all. And then last, being at home in yourself as you are, who you are, even as you engage the refuge of practice uh, uh, over the course of your life. And last, as we close, I invite you to join me in taking a few breaths to feel at home with each other here in this gathering. Here we are. Here we are. All together. In the refuge of community camaraderie, fellow practitioners, fellow travelers on the path. If the root of all sickness is homesickness, the root of all health is coming home. May you come home and be at home. Well, that's our formal end. And in a minute or so, my friend Art will step in to help organize small breakout rooms in Zoom of roughly three to five people. If you'd like to stick around to discuss for 20 or 30 minutes or so uh, what we've been exploring tonight, please stick around. Otherwise, uh, it's okay to tap the red leave button at the bottom of your screen and uh, depart. We'll come back next week, and I will continue this exploration of different aspects of wise effort and, you know, hope to bring a certain freshness uh, to this exploration in ways that are useful for you in everyday life. So it's been a really beautiful for me to feel at home with you. If you do want to be in those breakout rooms, stick around. Otherwise, it's time to wave. Time to wave and leave. Time to say goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Uh, in a moment, I'll turn off my camera and then I'll read through the chat, certainly, so you know I will have received what you've written, even if I'm not able to respond to it. Okay? So you all take good care. If you're going to go, now's the time to tap that red leave button and, and go. And otherwise, stick around. My friend Art will take it from here. I see you, Art. There you are. Very good. Thank goodness someone else is now flying the plane. Take care, you all. And I'll see you next week. May, may we be at home.